three, two, one, zero. Ignition. This launch sent four astronauts into space and made SpaceX the first company to ever take a full crew to the International Space Station. It's a big milestone for the new space race, which already has all the breakthroughs and patriotism of the first one. But space can feel irrelevant, at least considering all our problems back here on the ground. And that's not a new feeling. In fact, it's exactly how some folks felt during the original space race. I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. 10 years from now, I'll be paying still while Whitey's on the moon. Even revisiting the first moon landing, a story we think we know by heart, reveals parts that have been left out. We look back on the Apollo 11 launch, and we think at that moment, the entire country was united around um, getting to the moon. And that's not truthful history. There were anti-war activists who were critical of NASA's involvement in the Vietnam War. There were feminists who were very upset with NASA's all-male astronaut corps. Environmentalists and environmental scientists were concerned that NASA was not prioritizing science on its missions. But really, the most vocal uh, critics were civil rights activists. Outside the gates of the Kennedy Space Center, the day before the launch, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy organized a protest he brought with him 25 poor African-American families, four old mules, and uh, two rickety wagons. And he demanded a meeting with Thomas Paine, who was then the head of NASA. They were there to protest what he called, quote, the nation's distorted sense of national priorities. NASA was spending $20 million to house astronauts in these space capsules for 14 days when housing in the what was then called the American ghetto was crumbling in complete disarray. And as they moved towards the center of the field to greet one another, Abernathy's group started singing, We Shall Overcome. When it was Thomas Paine's turn to take the microphone, he actually looked quite moved. And he explained to Abernathy that if he could not push the button tomorrow and halt the launching of that rocket, he would. And then he gave Abernathy 25 VIP passes to the launch. Abernathy brought some families with him and used that moment to work the crowd and basically convince those VIPs that what was going on was unjust. NASA's popular image was tied to its budget. President Eisenhower established NASA as a civilian agency, not part of the military. And what that did is it, it, it tethered NASA to congressional purse strings. In the early 70s, that popularity began to decrease, partly because of these protests. And as that happened, NASA's budget also began to decrease. Development of space simply cannot be all government all the time if we want to have a truly space-faring civilization. By the early 21st century, NASA hoped to save money while also promoting innovation by giving contracts to private companies like SpaceX. And it's worked. Government contracts allowed SpaceX to innovate cheaper ways to get off this planet. But the source of that money hasn't changed. SpaceX is getting to space the same way NASA used to, with taxpayer dollars. Only it doesn't have to answer to taxpayers, even if they protest. Stop the launch! Just like hundreds of Armenian Americans who showed up at SpaceX headquarters in October, asking the company to change their plan to launch a satellite for the Turkish government. Activists worry it would help Turkey's ally, Azerbaijan, commit war crimes against Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. SpaceX didn't respond to a request for comment and is set to launch the satellite by the end of the year. Now, SpaceX says when they eventually get to Mars, they'll ignore all Earth-based governments in favor of making their own, essentially building a celestial-gated community that locks out everybody else. But everybody else is exactly who space is supposed to be for. So the U.S., along with every other spacefaring power and many other countries that don't have space programs are party to something called the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. This treaty says that space belongs to all of us. It was a vow to not treat outer space in any way remotely similar to how the most powerful have treated Earth for the past 500 years. But what we're looking at is a set of private actors 
whose actions are not entirely subject to democratic control when it comes to governing human conduct in outer space. That background to these private sector launches makes it nearly impossible to see these otherwise amazing achievements as a step for all humankind.